Hi, I'm Daniel Lukies and welcome to Book 101 Review. Uh, Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years. And today I have my special guest. He's CEO at Diversity and Luxury, Business Coach, Keynote Speaker, Podcaster, and Best-Selling Author too, no other than Miss Elizabeth Solaro. Welcome to Book on One, Miss Elizabeth, and can you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, thank you for having me on your show. I'm Elizabeth Solaru, I am based in London, and I run a couple of businesses. The first is the Luxury Business Emporium, and I'm also the CEO and founder of Diversity in Luxury Awards. Congratulations to your achievement, Miss Elizabeth, and thank you for sharing your talents to the world. So what defines a luxury brand in today's market? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, luxury brands are defined by many things. However, it really depends on the beholder. So it depends on, in my opinion, the client. So for some clients, it could be exclusivity. For some clients, it could be something that's rare. For some clients, it could be something that's very expensive. And for some clients, it could be something fresh and new. And that is some of the things that I cover in my new book, The Lux Printer. Wow. Thank you for this coming book. Is this your uh, debut uh, book or a second or third? Um, this is actually my second book because my first book was, um, it was a book about cakes, artisanal cakes. Um, that was, um, in a way, um, how I became famous. I started, um, I left a career in the city. I used to be a headhunter. Prior to that, I was a scientist. So I left all that behind. I became a cake maker and I started making cakes for the rich and famous and for royalty. And that was how I got introduced into the luxury world. So this second book that I've written called The Luxpreneur is all about the luxury uh, industry. So it's how to set up a luxury brand. Because when I read so many luxury books, I noticed that most of them were written by um, very wise, very experienced professors of luxury. Um, it was very, the, the books tended to be very academic, but there weren't basic, um, easily understood books that really broke down luxury. And more importantly, in many of the books that I read, they didn't really break down the different types of luxury client um, and also the different types of luxury businesses, because um, again, People who are not in that world, there's an intimidation or a fear that, oh, this is luxury. But I felt that there was a book, there was a gap in the market for a book that explained all these concepts. And therefore, you can identify where you fit either as a luxury brand owner or even as a luxury buyer. And here we are. And here we are, and I want all my podcasts to belong to be the luxury products, <laughs> a luxury podcast. So what are the key elements that distinguish a luxury brand from a premium brand? Ah, that's a fantastic question. And again, I cover that in the book. So um, there are several types of luxury brands, and you can go from what I call mastage. So that is you know, it's still for the masses, but it's slightly more expensive. Then you've got premium, then you've got ultra luxury, then you've got um, what some people even call super luxury. Um, so I break it, I break it, I break them all down. I think there are about five different um, categories of luxury brands. And with, with regards to a premium brand, premium brands um, high, are high quality, um, not easily attainable, 
but just but attainable enough. So if I saved up some money, for example, if I saved up and saved and saved up, I could probably um, fly business class, for example, but I may not be able to afford a private jet. No <laughs> 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 matter how much I save up. So I think for me, th that's how I explain some of these concepts in the book. I also use um, celebrity um, archetypes, for example, to try and explain these concepts. So if I talk about uh, the difference between, say, um, I don't know, say Beyonce and uh, Taylor Swift, if I use that as examples, people easily understand. So that's what I try to do in the book. Wow. How important is brand heritage in establishing a luxury brand? Another fantastic question. I love this. I really, really love this. Um, now, here's the thing. Heritage, heritage brands, um, I always say to people, they started as a one-man band. I don't care <laughs> who they are, uh, from Chanel to Hermes. The brand stories are about one founder who decided to do things differently. And then after so many years, 100, 200 years, they become a heritage brand. Um, some achieve that in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, but it takes time um, to, to become what they call a heritage brand. And that you have time, you also have longevity. And time is different to longevity because with longevity, it's time plus relevance. Because if you're, if you, no matter how long you've been around, if you're no longer relevant, you will not have a business. People will not buy from you. So that heritage, that, and part of that heritage is the storytelling, the folklore, the art, the artisanal bits. You know, we source our leather from X, Y, Z. We source our water from blah, blah, blah. Uh, the thread in our clothes, we source. But it, so it's things like that, that um, contribute to the heritage of the brand. And that what makes it very, very important in the eyes of the client. So because I always go back to seeing your brand through the eyes of your client. Um, and with a luxury brand or with a heritage brand, you will have a particular client type. And with that client type, there are certain bits about your heritage that they absolutely resonate with and love and want to associate with. So that in my mind defines a heritage brand. Um, can other brands become heritage brands? Absolutely. But like I said, it takes time and it takes longevity and being and keeping being relevant. Very well said, Ms. Elizabeth. Because of that, you have a big, big hand. So what role does exclusivity play in the perception of luxury brand? Oh, huge, 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 huge. Exclusivity is one of the pillars in my mind um, of, of creating uh, luxury products or even um, uh, trying to up your game because my book is also for people who want to say they want to get into the luxury industry or they want to level up um, their game. Now, exclusivity is absolutely vital. But I always say to my clients or people that I coach, I always say this to them. If you were strictly exclusive, your price tag will be absolutely huge. Your price tag will be enormous. And there might only be maybe 10, 100 people in the world that can afford your products because you're uber exclusive. <laughs> but let's learn lessons from brands that are also uber exclusive, but they manage to survive uh, financially because at the end of the day, we're a business and it's all about cash flow. So exclusivity is amazing. And there are ways in which you can roll that out. So to give an example, if I take a well-known brand like Dior, for example, um, and I see Dior on several levels. So you have um, Haute Couture, so that's exclusive, exclusive, done for you, will probably cost you £100,000. And then at the other end, you have your lipsticks, your perfumes, things that people like me can easily save up for 
and buy. It's still exclusive, but there's a hierarchy of exclusivity. Mm. And this is where very successful luxury brands, this is where they get it right. Because certain things are super, super exclusive and the price and time and um, the artistry will keep people like me, will gatekeep people like me out of it. So I can't afford um, haute couture. I just can't. However, I can go and pick up a lipstick um, and they can say, actually, we created a new range of lipsticks. Um, it could be something like there's only two shades and we only create a thousand. And once they're gone, they're gone. Again, that is another level of exclusivity. So those are some of the things that even as a normal business or a luxury brand, we can actually borrow from them and copy, if that makes sense. So exclusivity is absolutely important in the establishment of a luxury brand, but it's the way you play on that exclusivity as a small business. That is what you need to be um, aware of because many of us don't have the money or the budget as a brand like Dior. Yes, makes sense. So how can storytelling enhance the appeal of a luxury brand? Again, another amazing question. Um, and in fact, in some of the introductory pages of my book, I talk about the importance of stories. So many storytelling is an art form, is not something that is easily taught or or that we're really taught in school. I know we, we're told to write essays, but we're not really taught um, the art of storytelling. And some people have a natural propensity for telling stories. So in the book, I try to use an example of, a, of how to do that practically, because you can use storytelling um, to invoke what I call extreme emotion. Um, because usually with luxury items, they move you from, I can't afford this, to what do I have to do to get my hands on this? <laughs> Which is completely, <laughs> you know, so you're starting from, oh my God, I can't afford haute couture. And then you see the dress and you think, right, that's it. I don't care what I have to do. I've got to have it. So it's that emotion that you want to invoke when you tell the story of your brand. So um, I use the example of, it, um, of Coco Chanel. So Coco Chanel, uh, grew, uh, I think, lost her mother, uh, grew up in an orphanage. She was taught to sew and she created Chanel. Yes. That's, that's a story, right? But if I were to use the art of storytelling, I will set the scene. I will talk about um, um, uh, all the things she had to go through. I will talk about the streets of Paris. I will talk about one stormy night, you know, her father took her to the orphanage with tears in his eyes. He said, please educate my child. The nuns took pity on her. They taught her how to sew. Um, they couldn't afford any, any fabric. So they had to use. So do you see where I'm going with this? So, you know, again, um, with storytelling, there are several types, you know, with that, um, I'm kind of using the hero's journey um, methodology of telling her story. So um, rags to riches, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the art of storytelling. And that's often missing for many brands, in my opinion, because many brands, um, they just tell a straightforward story. We, ha we were established in 18 something and we have been making bags for 150 years. And I'm thinking, so what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. However, storytelling doesn't just have to be via text. It can be visual as well. So you can use video to tell a story. You can use images, um, great photography to tell a story. I remember um, there was a shoe brand uh, many, many, about 25 years ago. One of the first um, luxury websites that I ever saw that resonated with me, it was an Italian shoe bra brand. I think it was Bruno, Ma Bruno Magli, I think, you know, excuse the, uh, 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 the pronunciation. And what they did was that they took a pair of shoes and they pulled the shoes apart. 
So all the leather pieces with the thread, with the needle, beautifully photographed. And you had this reel that showed you pieces of leather up until the finished product. And that kind of storytelling, I still remember 25 years later. So that's my point. So storytelling is so, so crucial when it comes to luxury brands. And what we don't, sometimes we don't understand is that these luxury brands, they've spent millions, millions yes. telling their stories. That's true, Miss Elizabeth. But before we go on, I want to shout out my ranking tops for the last 30 days because in Mexico, I got 41 audience share. Uh, I got 41 on the Apple chart, I just said. New Zealand at 81, Thailand, Tanzania, Tanzania, Moldova, United Kingdom, Egypt, Poland, and Norway. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers, authors all over the world like Miss Elizabeth Solaru. What are the essential characteristics of luxury brand positioning? That is another excellent, excellent question. So in positioning, you want to, you want to, you want, you need to know exactly where you fit, where you stand. Um, and this is sometimes a bit tricky because if you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> If you've got many products, not all your products are going to fit in certain categories. So, for example, I give an example of Dior. The Hook Couture, that would be ultra, ultra luxury, ultra, ultra high. And then your lipsticks, your perfumes, etc. they could be mastage. But if you are a small business, you need to think, okay, I'm a small business. Do I want to serve the ultra high end? Or do I want to do the mastage, the premium, or the or, or just the high end? So you need to think about where do I position myself because the different um, different luxury client types are going to buy different. Um, they're going to buy different items. So to to give an example, and this is a a recent one, a brand like Laura Piana, Laura Piana, synonymous with quiet luxury. And it kind of had, it kind of came to focus because of the program Succession. So they dressed all the characters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Laura Piana, off, based off the success of that, they actually um, did a collaboration with an influencer on TikTok. Now, that would have shocked a lot of people because you, when you think luxury, you don't think TikTok. For yes. many people. But I often say to my clients, believe it or not, um, the coolest, most successful luxury brands are actually on TikTok. But it's the way they use the platform. So the collaboration that um, Laura Piana did with this influencer, it was phenomenally successful. They created it because it was a complete, complete collaboration. It wasn't just the um, person modeling a few clothes or shoes or whatever they created a whole range of items around this influencer and many of the items sold out in hours in hours on the tiktok platform so my point is luxury is still the essence of luxury is the same but how it's perceived and how it's used is changing and will continue to change so I, I, I think, in my opinion, that for me is how brands can try to position themselves. Yes, indeed. So do you think your cakes will be available on TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> They're fabulous. Oh, my goodness. Magnificent cakes, people. So how can a luxury brand maintain its exclusivity while expanding its customer base? Oh, now that is another tricky one, because again, you don't want to go into the mass market, you know, mass market, but at the same time, you still, so it's always been, I, I call it the, um, like a pendulum, you know, up a bit, down a bit, up a bit. So there's got to be a bit of balance. Um, for me, this is what I think. Luxury brand, your core product, whatever it is you're famous for, make that exclusive, maintain the exclusivity 
for your core products. So for example, Hermes, handbags, for example, um, that you know, particular, the Birkin, uh, people are crazy about it. They've got waiting lists and they maintain that exclusivity. However, you can then play around with a couple of other products that you have. So for example, Hermes, um, people may not know this, but they were actually famous for scarves before they were famous for handbags. So the late queen, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth, she was one of their biggest customers when it came to the scarves. So if I were a mess, for example, I will play around with the scarves and I will play around with one or two other items. So a couple of years ago, they brought out um, this fabulous, fabulous range of nail polish. Again, that will attract more clients um, for that particular item or product and purpose so clients feel they own a tiny bit of Hermes however the exclusive products the handbags they need to really 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 protect and gatekeep those for as long as they possibly can so that for me would be a way for a brand to manage that balance yes balance it people and because of that uh, Miss Elizabeth very well said, very well said. And how important is product quality in building a luxury brand? Oh, product quality is everything. Product quality is everything. I, um, when I'm coaching uh, some of the businesses that I do, I say to them, don't even bother coming into the luxury sector if you don't have a good product. Here's the irony, it doesn't have to be the best product. Because some people think, oh my God, I've got to put everything into it. It's got to be the best. No, um, it might be slightly controversial, but it's got to be a good product. When it's a good product, you've got something, you've got a, a nice base that you can build off. So product quality is everything. It's got to be able to do what it says on the tin plus a little bit more. However, what you then build around your product is the brand, the story, the um if you have to create a waiting list create a waiting list um find something that is exclusive to you something that you do best so for example i i use myself as an example when i started my cake company anyone can bake anybody can bake um as long as you have an oven as long as you can follow a recipe anyone can bake but you need to have your added value um as a as a as a cake maker so what was my added value my added value in those days, many, many years ago, was doing cakes that many people didn't want to do. So I took risks. I did shapes. I did, um, I explored a lot. Um, I traveled outside of the UK. I went to learn certain techniques in America. I followed certain um, cake makers. Um, even when it came to vanilla, for example, uh, the best vanilla comes from Mexico. Many people don't know that. Um, sourcing ingredients from around the world. So doing things like that is my added value. So when I'm in front of a client, um, as I was a couple of days ago, in because I was flown out to Paris to do a tasting, and I was able to say to the client, uh, the peaches in this cake comes from blah, the champagne comes from this region. It's storytelling like that, that gives you the added value when it comes to um, your brand. So product quality, you cannot, you cannot joke with it. It's absolutely important. Number one ingredients. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Al Hassan, for watching us. Thank you so much. So, what strategies can be employed to create a strong brand identity for a luxury brand? Ah, that's a really, really good one. So, again, I discussed some of it in the book. So identity so think about okay good I, let's let's do something a bit different tell me a, a, your favorite luxury brand so just tell me and we'll go through how they in my opinion what makes for a strong um, brand identity with them so and that way people could probably learn from that so tell me your favorite brand my favorite brand tesla sorry tesla excellent 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 so we have a very strong founder who is a personality, controversial. Some people love him, some people hate him. Controversial, yeah. But, but it doesn't matter. Funnily enough, the more controversial, the better. 
because we tend to remember people that stand out than people that blend in the background. So there's that personal identity as well. Um, he also, but in my opinion, for example, I actually um, put him, because in the book, I actually mention him in the book. Um, I put him as, for me anyway, he's a slash between a visionary stroke, an icon, if that makes sense. Some people is an icon, some people is a visionary, some people is a, a controversy. But that doesn't matter. What, tech, what matters is establishing that brand identity. When you look at his background, he is someone who invests a lot in different things. So um, if something is going to be successful, I don't know, PayPal, Uber, et cetera, et cetera, he somehow will invest in that and he will be successful. So he has a track record of success. So that track record of success has followed him into Tesla. He didn't, he wasn't the founder of Tesla. From what I understand, I believe he bought Tesla. And he is one of these people that's very open to ideas because he said uh, the Tesla car, for example, not the car, was it the truck? Sorry, the Tesla truck. Um, some, I think his son or, or somebody, you know, one of his kids turned to him and said, why can't we build a truck that looks like the future? And he thought, ah, the, so this is why I classify him as a visionary. So in building your luxury brand identity, you need to know who you are, where you stand, if that makes sense. So I, di I discuss the different archetypes. So for me, for example, my archetype is artisan, craftsman, because I love making cakes, the passion is there. But yeah. somebody like Elon Musk, who's a visionary, um, he is not as if he enjoys making cars <laughs> or anything <laughs> like that, but he's a visionary. He, he knows where the future is going. He was talking about AI way before many people were talking about AI. So again, it's about you, in order to build that strong brand identity, you need to know your own archetype. Are you a salesman? Are you a networker? Are you a craftsman? Are you a visionary? I think I talk about nine different types that I have um, um, found, the different types of archetypes of luxury brand owners in, in luxury. So again, um, it's about you knowing who you are and what you stand for. And that's the way you will then build a following, a community that will rally around you. Uh, so somebody like um, Elon Musk, for example, I even talk about the type of people he needs around him, because when you are a visionary, you need people that will ground you because you're seeing the future and you need to bring people with you. And the people in your team are going uh, slow down. You know, we're not quite seeing what you're seeing, but we will follow you because we believe in you. So that, in my opinion, is what you need to do in order to build a luxury brand. Yes, indeed. Speaking of Elon Musk and uh, Miss Chanel, Coco Chanel, please do read or listen to the biography, Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson, one of a kind. So, Miss Elizabeth, what role does customer experience play in the success of a luxury brand? Customer experience is everything. Um, the customer... I, I use the saying in my book, the customer is king, but the luxury brand is a kingmaker because behind every king is a kingmaker. So the, 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 the relationship should be symbiotic and people will, if they have a brilliant experience with you, they, they would maybe tell one or two people. If they had a bad experience with you, they'll probably tell 10 people. And sometimes it's not um, whether things go bad or things go wrong. It's how you fix it. And it's also the language that you use in a customer experience. So there's a language of luxury um, that I firmly believe that uh, sometimes I think some, some organizations have lost the art of the language of luxury. Um, some, some places still do it really, really well. Um, to give an example, I was in Paris um, this weekend, came back yesterday, and 
unfortunately, because of the Olympics, everywhere, all the roads in central Paris closed. Closed. And all you see <laughs> closed. Literally closed. With no traffic, you know, no cars, nothing. And all you can see are the gendarmes, the policemen with the guns, you know, really big ones and <laughs> little ones. I come from the UK where, you know, I, at the sight of the gun, I, I nearly fainted. And then you have to show your, they, they give you a QR code. You have to show your passport. You have to show a letter from the hotel. And the hotel, literally in front of the hotel, the Olympic um, thing was being built on the uh, Place de la Concorde. Um, so what did the hotel do? I love what they did. They know it's an inconvenience. They know people can't come in through the normal route. So they literally sent somebody down with a trolley down to the side road where I was parked to come and get all my stuff. Oh, wow. And to, you know, and they brought water, they brought towel, you know, so, the, and they were like, <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, you know, obviously things are going wrong, but it was the way, um, it was handled. So. The customer experience for me, when it comes to luxury, is paramount. Um, you, and I say to people, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be as frictionless as possible. So, and you, you need to think, okay, if people go on my website, um, is it going to load in three seconds? Are people going to find the information that they want really, really quickly? Um, do I make it easy for them to buy? So you need to think of your website as you, when you're looking, looking at your website, don't you think, oh, my God, it's a beautiful website or, or and the web design is going to tell you they did an amazing job. You need to look at it from the perspective of your client. You need to think, OK, if I had if I was Elon Musk, or if I'm Beyonce and I want to buy a cake from me, have I made it easy for them? And I sometimes some of my best clients, they literally WhatsApp me. Um, one sentence and say, I'm going to be in London, X, Y, Z. Uh, can you, can you make a cake? Literally just that. And what I then do is I would just say to them, uh, tell me who I, you know, tell me who, yes, I'm available, but tell me who to speak to in terms of delivery and details. So they'll give me the number of an assistant so I can bother them with all the, with all the details. So make, so for me, that friction eliminates as much friction as you can you know yes. all, all they want to know is they're in town they want a cake cake appeared they don't want to know oh my god i can't even deliver to the hotel because it's been closed <laughs> <laughs> and i have to walk i don't have to walk back home, you know Oh, well, 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 very well said, Miss Elizabeth. I have fun talking to you. I hate to let you go, but can you come back next week and let's continue our discussion about luxury brand and let's promote your cakes and books. So, Miss Elizabeth, can you please invite our listeners to support your books and, of course, your fabulous cakes? Yes, I would absolutely Yes, people, let's support Miss Elizabeth Solaro because if you support her, more, more empowering books, more, more empowering cakes to come so miss elizabeth thank you for your time thank you more to come people see you soon miss